Hello and welcome to your Wine 101 course. Bienvenue. Are you interested in wine? What questions do you have? Have you always wondered about wine, wine regions, where it's grown, how it's made, what pairs with food? My name is Malcolm Lamont. I will be your instructor for this five week course, five class course on Wine 101 from Constructive Wine Online. I'm an educator. My background is a Bachelor of Ed, which I completed in 2012, as well as a graduate degree in Education Studies from the uh, UK-based Wine and Spirit Education Trust, WSET. I completed in 2018 the Diploma in Wines and Spirits, uh, considered uh, gold standard in wine education, and uh, the lead provider of wine, spirits, sake courses worldwide. And from the US-based Society of Wine Educators, completed a certified wine educator uh, qualification. I'm happy to walk you through uh, this five week course uh, or five class course. You can complete it in uh, the time you like. It's uh, posted online to Constructive Wine Online. Uh, class one will be today. We'll do wine appreciation as well as wine making. So viticulture and vinification or uh, grape growing and wine making. Uh, following class is on grape varieties, so many uh, common grape varieties that we know about, and we'll do a dive into those. Class 3 is on Old World wines, so essentially the wines of Europe. We'll look at regions like Spain, as well as parts of France, parts of Italy, and others. Uh, following week is New World Wine, so outside of Europe, as well as a lesson on wine and food matching. And Class 5 will be on specialty wines like sparkling and fortified wines as well as how to read a wine label. So I hope you're excited. We'll dive in in just a minute. This is a, a, a syllabus document, a, a course curriculum that um, I'll post online. You can look, uh, if you're looking for the individual pieces of uh, subject matter we'll cover, they're uh, posted here uh, in this uh, mind map document. So for you to enjoy. So if you're all uh, set, if you're ready, if you have a glass of wine, I highly encourage you to, to taste along your favorite wine uh, with today's lesson and any of the classes that follow. And uh, do give your uh, full attention as best you can. Uh, we'll cover these topics uh, and I'll try to make them interesting and enjoyable uh, as we taste together and, and teach and learn uh, together here online. So for today's class, uh, we'll outline the four steps of wine appreciation. So you'll be able to uh, describe the terroir. Do you know what terroir is? You'll be able to describe the terroir and how grapes are grown. And also describe the winemaking process. We'll go into the, into the winemaking process uh, in today's class as well. So if you're all set, let's go. So wine appreciation is like appreciating a fine work of art. It's also like uh, watching a finely tuned athlete. And it's most definitely like enjoying a fine dish, a fine meal, and appreciating uh, the textures, the tastes, and the various components and work that went into uh, producing that bottle of wine. So how do you taste wine? And here we're talking about uh, wine appreciation as opposed to wine drinking. Uh, drinking is great, enjoyable, uh, but wine tasting can be more enjoyable. It can enhance your experience. Um, it's a skill that you can develop over time with training under an educator or sommelier. And uh, so let's take a look at that. So the four steps are appearance, nose, palette and finish so I'll go through that so appearance you'll look down is kind of looking at the wine and trying to detect we'll talk about uh, what you're looking for and then the nose is taking a nice sniff and enjoying the lovely lovely flavors that we get uh, in various wines palette is to take a sip and swish and then the finish is the the aftertaste or the lingering pleasant uh, flavors that you get after you've uh, swallowed the wine so let's Look at those. Uh, one mnemonic you can use, uh, one trick to remember is the six S's of wine appreciation. 
So six S's are to see, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, and savor. So let's see, so we can, again, you wanna look. You're looking down at the wine and detecting uh, color, intensity and color. And then swirl. So swirling is actually, uh, it, it can be important because it um, increases the contact of oxygen with the wine and that releases aromas into the bowl of the, the glass, which you can then smell. Take a sniff and a sip. Swish it around so it gets all parts of your mouth, just like with mouthwash and it's really quite enjoyable and, and flavorful. And then savors to, to focus on the uh, finish and the pleasant flavors at the end. So what are we looking for? So the, the four steps, do you remember what the four steps are? There's one here, appearance. And then appearance, nose, palate, and finish. All right, so appearance, we're gonna look for intensity. Oops. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, looking for intensity, so how, how concentrated the uh, color is. So in this, I would say it's a pale intensity, and this is a pale lemon. So most white wines will be pale lemon or, or lemon, maybe medium. If there's a bit of orange or brown, it can be gold uh, for a white wine. And if it's uh, just like biting an apple and leaving it on the counter and oxidizing it, it it'll eventually turn brown and wines will eventually turn brown uh, with, with oxidation as well. So potentially it's intentionally uh, oxidized and made in that style, like a like a nice sherry um, or other white wines, but um, most will be lemon. Some might be golded with a bit of age, uh, but uh, looking for intensity and color. On red wines, it can be ruby, is a common, uh, like a bright red ruby color. With a bit of uh, oxidation, it'll start to brown like a brown brick or garnet. If you picture um, uh, burgundy, uh, red, red, brown, red, and red wines can get quite brown as well and evolve into um, maybe a, a, a tawny port or a brown style uh, oxidized wine. So on the nose, is the wine sound? So do you detect any musty basement or struck matches? Musty basement would be cork taint. Uh, struck matches is sulfur, fault. And vinegar wine eventually turns into vinegar. so. Um, if it's done that too quickly, then it might be a fault. And uh, that's where you detect it is on the nose. So try and detect uh, different fruits, flowers, spices. Which ones are you detecting? Is it lemon, uh, peach, melon? A tool that can help you determine this is developed by Ann Noble at UC Davis in the 1990s, University of California at Davis, and it's the aroma wheel. And it works by uh, looking at the innermost circle, and is it nutty? So you detect the aromas, and you're smelling them in your, in your um, uh, as you're tasting the wine on the four um, steps to appreciating wine. And so is, if it's fruity, is it a tree fruit? So then you go to the next circle. And if it's a tree fruit, is it apricot, peach, apple, um, or if it's citrus, lemon, grapefruit, lime, a tangerine. And it can also be earthy, woody, caramel nutty, herbaceous or vegetative. There's some other uh, descriptors that you can use and you can use this as a tool to help uh, develop your tasting skill and ability to um, describe your wines. Okay, so we've done appearance, nose, palate. The tongue detects only sweetness sour, bitterness, salty, and umami. And among these, really the first three are, are the ones that you'll find most in wine, sweetness, sour, and bitter. Uh, sometimes salty, sometimes umami. But the tongue's only detecting those five uh, tastes. It's not getting any flavors like honey or peach or lemon. Uh, those are detected retronasally as the aromas travel up through the back of your nose and into your uh, nose uh, organ where it's detected and, and sent to the brain. Uh, to, rec to recognize. So flavors are detected retronasally. And finally, the finish is how long the pleasant flavors last. So uh, you sw uh, see, swirl, sniff, 
sip, swish, sorry, <laughs> see, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, savor. And the savoring is how long the pleasant flavors are going to linger uh, on the palate. So you might get um, nice flavors of lemon or nutty or honeyed. Uh, and um, they might be tart lemon, might be complex uh, nutty, honeyed. Um, uh, but it's how long the pleasant flavors last. And so uh, components like acidity or alcohol or sweetness or tannins, those aren't part, considered part of the fi finish. But the, the pleasant flavors that linger and the, think about the nature and the character of those uh, pleasant flavors. Okay, so uh, we can pause there. Uh, if you'd like to go top up your glass uh, or otherwise take a break, you're welcome to. And we'll carry on uh, uh, when you get back. And we'll go on to uh, vinificate, uh, sorry, uh, viticulture, so how to, how to grow grapes how grapes are grown in the vineyard throughout the world. And uh, if you're all set, let's uh, go for it. So there's a proverb here, you can't make good wine from bad grapes. And this is true, so it requires good quality sites, good terroirs, in order to produce good quality grapes that are then brought into the winery. And it's considered that only the winemaker can make the wine worse than the potential of the grapes uh, coming in. So you can't make good wine uh, from bad grapes. So what is uh, terroir? Do you have a definition? Some say it's a marketing tool, but really it is a lot. Most people consider that it's the uh, factors that impact the vine and the way it grows and hence the grapes it produces and ultimately the wines that it makes. So terroir is all the things that affect, all the factors that affect how the grapes grow. Like the climate is important, soil, the slope, grape variety, and the yield. And they would also say the hand of the winemaker. So the winemaker's style impacts the terroir uh, as well. So we'll take a look at uh, each of these. So first the climate. And uh, did you know that grapes generally only grow between 30 and 50 degrees latitude north and south of the equator? Uh, this is a temperate zone, and north of there, or south in the southern hemisphere, uh, is too too cold. It doesn't it has a hard time ripening. Although some grapes are grown in Scandinavia and other parts of um, the north, uh, but uh, this temperate zone, and then in the in the um, trop tropical zone and subtropical zone, uh, it's a, it's a bit too it's almost too too warm and too rainy. And they actually get two crops in a season. So it's not quite, um, you, you can grow grapes in certainly in parts of India, um, uh, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Brazil. Uh, but uh, it's a different type of viticulture. It's, uh, the, the commercial wine growing is generally just between 30 and 50 degrees uh, latitude. So you can break that band, 30 to 50, into cool, moderate, and warm uh, climates. And these are loosely defined. Uh, but cool is going to be more polar, so more north in the northern hemisphere, more south in the southern hemisphere. Moderate, uh, kind of more equatorial from there. And warm, the closest to that 30 degree uh, latitude. What kind of wines do cool climates produce? Uh, climates like in northern France, such as Alsace or Champagne, southern part of England or Germany, Ontario, British Columbia, these produce high acid, low, low alcohol wines with fresh fruit flavors. Uh, so uh, for example, I have here a uh, Northern Italian uh, Pinot Grigio. And it's not exactly a cool climate, although it's, it is cooler, uh, towards moderate or cool, I would say. And it, it, this is very fresh with lighter alcohol, uh, fairly simple. Uh, so it does, does suit the, the, the terroir. Moderate uh, climates such as Bordeaux, Piemonte, the Pacific Northwest like Southern British Columbia, Washington State, parts of Oregon, um, produce wines with balanced alcohol, body and acidity. So it can be a little bit fuller in alcohol and a little bit lower in acidity, uh, but balanced uh, overall. And warm climates such as Spain, Southern Italy, Napa Valley in uh, California, produce high alcohol, full bodied wines with ripe fruit, lower acidity, and uh, really that ripe, dried, kind of prune, raisin 
uh, full-bodied style uh, wines. So there are various soils that we'll find throughout vineyards in the world. We'll just cover uh, three of them here. One is gravel, and this is a, a very loose stone soil. So the, the um, there's a lot of water drainage, and so the, the vines will dive deep to get more water and nutrients uh, in, the, in these gravelly soils. Conversely, there's uh, clay soils, which is very small particles, so attracts water and is very quite dense and uh, quite a, kind of uh, thick. Uh, so it's very hard for vines to, to go deeper than that and so they'll stay, stay lower. So clay is a type of soil uh, you'll find in vineyards. And alluvial is a type of soil that you find in riverbeds and valleys. And this is kind of like a, like a potting soil or potting dirt. And it's very nutrient rich so you can have very high yields um, from uh, alluvial soils. And now what are yields? Are you familiar with uh, high yields versus low yields? It has to do with the quantity of grapes coming from a single hectare or single acre, single area of land. And the higher the yield, it's generally considered that there's less nutrients in each grape and, and so they're not producing as good a fruit. So the better terroirs are typically lower yields and, um, and the best vineyards will all have low yields um, and so, so not many of the best vineyards, to my knowledge, are alluvial uh, soils. The slope also affects terroir. So in Roman times, they, they, there was a saying that Bacchus amit callus, uh, pardon my Latin, but uh, Bacchus, the god of wine, and um, Bacchus, the god of wine, loves amit hills, hillsides, callus. So uh, they, they found that the better vines I guess they would have been Falernian, was a famous uh, Roman wine. Um, uh, would have been grown on the hillsides of um, central Italy and nor northern Italy as well. So Bacchus Emmet Cullis. Okay, we're moving along. So I, we'll look at the vine growth cycle. So what do, how does a vine grow? So in the northern hemisphere, um, starts around March or April, sometimes as late as May, but certainly by March or April, you'll start to see bud burst where the, um, the bud is coming out of the cane and that bud will eventually turn into the, the um, shoots which have the, the fruit and leaves uh, for the vine. So it's all compact in that little bud that starts to come out in March or April, start to see the first signs of life uh, in the spring in the vineyard. In the Southern Hemisphere, um, of course, it's September and October that this is happening, bud burst and it basically follows an inverse um, calendar in the southern uh, hemisphere. So by May, June, we start to see flowering where uh, flowers start to appear and uh, the vine will fertilize itself, each flower that gets fertilized. Uh, so if it's not too windy, um, each flower then develops into a single grape. So for, for this is flowering is a very important time to, for fruit set and for grape uh, set. And the, once the flowers are set, it'll continue to ripen and they'll grow. There'll be these little green uh, nubs. Have you seen those uh, in the vineyards? These little pre veraison uh, grapes and uh, start to turn interesting colors um, during veraison in August, July, August, certainly by September, even in the coolest climates. And there's a picture of that uh, number three. And then the most exciting time and the most crucial time for setting quality as well as style and um, possibly yield as well for the, for the vigneron and for the winemaker is harvest in September and October in the Northern Hemisphere and March and April in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is the, the life cycle of the vine. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, type them into the chat. I'm curious to, see, to know if you're still following along and interested in, uh, in this. But feel free to type any questions into the chat. You can take a, another break. We'll go on to our third and final section of wine making. Uh, so we've covered wine appreciation as well as vit viticulture, grape growing. And we'll do our last uh, section in the last five, five or ten minutes uh, on winemaking. So if you'd like to take a break, you're welcome to. Uh, we'll come back in just a minute. There's a, a YouTube video here from the uh, wine board of Bourgogne, uh, Bourgogne Wine Board. 
And uh, it's an excellent video, short video, three minute video on uh, wine, the winemaking process. It covers red winemaking. We won't go into too much more detail on that. Uh, in this class, maybe I'll present a, a wine 201 or wine 301 that covers more in depth on winemaking and uh, other topics. But for now, just uh, encourage you to check out this link and uh, we'll carry on. So we will talk about two important concepts, uh, one being fermentation as, and the second being oak aging and oak barrels. So fermentation is the magic of winemaking. Uh, you can't have wine without fermentation. Beer is also fermented. There are non-alcoholic fermentations such as uh, kombucha. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, you know, cheese, coffee, chocolate, some of the most delicious things in, in, in the world for us are fermented uh, products. So what is fermentation? It's uh, single-celled organisms, yeast, a type of um, fungus actually, uh, a yeast cell will consume the sugar that's from the grapes uh, that are harvested. So grapes grow through the vine cycle and they're on the terroir and are harvested and come into the uh, winery, as you may have seen in the Bourgogne video. And uh, these yeasts are added to the sugar tank, the, the grape sugar, the must, and then the yeast will consume that sugar over the course of six days, seven days, eight days, sometimes longer, sometimes a little bit quicker, depending on temperatures. Uh, and uh, eventually convert all of it into alcohol and uh, carbon dioxide so that, uh, that that is where you have the wine so that wine is fermented grape sugar and the carbon dioxide is a gas that blows off um, uh, in the process. It also produces heat uh, but the important part is uh, alcohol uh, which we all love and that's why we love wine and uh, why perhaps why it's so interesting but it's a very complicated process and very interesting process and um, highly encourage you to um, check it out in a, in a wine region if, if you've worked a harvest uh, or if you're interested in touring in September and October or March and April in the Southern Hemisphere um, of checking out uh, this process. So we also have uh, oak aging, uh, French oak having to do with which forest the uh, oak staves and barrels came from. Uh, French oak will give a vanilla and toast character. Another very interesting process, oak barrels are toasted uh, in order to bend the staves and form the barrels. And so that toast flavor results in a, you know, whether it's a Chardonnay or a Pinot Noir or a Nebbiolo, a Cabernet Sauvignon that has uh, some oak to it, Shiraz. Um, if it's French oak, it'll give vanilla and toast. If the oak comes from an American forest, it's a little bit different of a species. It's a white oak. Uh, Corcus alba, I believe, and that gives vanilla and toast, as well as clove and coconut and dill. Uh, some delicious uh, flavors, uh, which I personally really enjoy, uh, although I, I'm aware there's a, I understand there's a large um, kind of debate uh, going on between whether or not we should use oak uh, and no oak. And whether or not you're using uh, new oak uh, it makes a big difference. So. Um, when these oak barrels are brought into the winery, if they're just newly harvested, they have a lot of that vanillin. It's actually vanilla, you know, a vanillin compound in the, in the oak staves, and that gets into the barrel or clove or coconut or dill if it's American. So uh, you can, if it's a first fill or even second or third, uh, it will transfer some of that flavor into the wine, and, and that'll result in a, a altered wine, a slightly altered wine. Uh, but if it's fourth or fifth fill, so once the barrels have been used for three or four years, five years, um, it's like a tea bag. Have you ever had the experience where you had a cup of tea and then went to have a second cup of tea with the same bag? And by about the third or fourth or fifth, it was, it's like that with the, with the oak barrels, that they start to lose uh, their flavor. And so that can be a good thing. They're then neutral uh, oak barrels, which can be uh, still used for, for oxidate, oxidative uh, uh, oak aging. All right, so that was a whirlwind tour, uh, just under 30 minutes. I hope you enjoyed class number one. I hope uh, to see you for class number two uh, next week or next time. Uh, so we'll have uh, top eight uh, grape varieties as well as just a quick uh, smattering of some other interesting uh, great varieties to demonstrate. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you'll stay tuned for Constructive Wine Online. 
and uh, cheers to you.